Cracker Barrel is a place where many families come to to enjoy a good meal. However, police say that all came to an abrupt end when a gunman walked in and opened fire. Road conditions are dry and clear now, but that won't be the case for long. As of right now, no one is in custody, but deputies with the Lowndes County Sheriff's Department are actively searching for a suspect. Workers here at the Columbus Forensic Lab are some of the first people called out to a crime scene to collect evidence. Drones are cool and unique because they give you a bird's eye view of certain images. But if you don't follow these rules and use them the wrong way, they can become dangerous. 18-year-old Jared Hanna of Louisville is being charged with murder and is currently behind bars here at the Winston County Correctional Facility. Lawmakers are gabbling in for session right now as we speak to get things underway. And as you just mentioned, this is a highly anticipated session. Right now, there are still more questions than answers, but what we do know is this all started when a missing persons report was filed. Investigators were led to the home of the missing person, and while searching that property, that's when investigators discovered a body. Southern Monroe County was at the center of a crime scene early Friday morning as yellow crime tape surrounded this yellow home where a body was discovered. Actually, the body was found in the back yard. It was... Uh, folded up and um, looked like maybe a sh couple of shower curtains and a tarpaulin, mm -hmm. and it was inside of a blue um, tote bag uh, back there. The body was found hidden outside a home on Buck Road. Monroe County Sheriff Cecil Cantrell says deputies were originally at the home investigating a missing persons report that was filed earlier in the week for a Monroe County man. Well, we had a disappearance of Mr. Stephen Hubner about Monday, uh, we came out and did an investigation and uh, found that he was missing. According to Cantrell, 54-year-old Stephen Hubner, who was a civilian employee at the Columbus Air Force Base, left home for a business trip to Montgomery, Alabama, only to never be heard from again. We knew the guy was missing. He did not show up at work come Monday, her husband, and we uh, were looking for him. And we've been looking for him since since then. Continuing their search, deputies pinged his cell phone. According to investigators, the address that popped up turned out to be the home where the body was found, and it also happens to be the home of the missing man. We really, you know, we don't know who's in that in that bag at this point. At this time, Cantrell says they're not identifying the body, and they're still unable to determine the exact cause of the victim's death. At this point, we can't verify that it's a missing guy because we can't identify. We just know that we do have a body and that we're sending it to Jackson for an autopsy. Now, deputies say they just want to speak with one of the homeowners living at the residence. We don't know where his wife is at this point. We've, uh, we've got a bolo out on his wife trying to find her. Now, this is still an ongoing investigation. If you have any information on this crime, you're asked to contact the Monroe County Sheriff's Office. They're heartbroken and devastated. Faculty received a letter on Tuesday saying that after today, they would have to put a stop to all of their services because they won't be receiving any more funds from the government due to the shutdown. However, workers say they're not going to close their doors. Instead, they're going to fight back. Due to the partial federal government shutdown. Our subgrant with you must be terminated effective immediately. As L. Marie Carbrooks reads a disheartening letter saying that Emerson Family School and J.L. King must now close their doors, a sense of devastation and disbelief starts to set in. We have parents that come here every evening. You see the parents out here now. They are here every evening trying to improve, trying to expose their children, trying to do, they are volunteering, just trying to do better. And then you say, shut it down? You can't do that. The J.L. King Center is a popular spot for positive after-school activities. Students do their homework, read books, and they even learn computer skills. However, the government shutdown is now putting all of that in jeopardy. You hear the chatter in there. You know those kids are happy. And you know the people they're working with, they're happy. And they're benefiting, they're profiting from it. So why would you even think that you can write a letter in one day and say, discontinue that? That's, that's, that's just, it's just mean. It's just absolutely mean. 
Both Emerson and King received funds from the Department of Human Services. However, those funds are now fizzling out and they won't receive any more after Thursday. But despite this setback, Brooks says she cares too much about her students and she refuses to let that stop her. I'm not going to close the door and let that let those children down. Instead, she's going to fight back. Brooks says she's going to do whatever she can to keep the doors open, even if it means fighting volunteers to come in and donate their time and services to the center. We refuse to do that. Uh, whether the funding is from Families First for Mississippi or whoever is, you know, I mean, we, we cannot, we cannot, absolutely, we cannot close our doors to death. Now, tomorrow morning, Brooks is holding a public meeting with stakeholders and community members to discuss ideas for continuing their services. That meeting will be at 1030 at the J.L. King Center, and it is open to the public. There you go, there you go. It's no secret there's a lot of physical contact in the game of football. But that doesn't stop thousands of kids from wanting to play. Just ask LaToya Bogard. Her son plays for the Starkville Cowboys. He looks forward to every Saturday, every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, coming out here and practicing and showing the kids what he can do. Her son plays center on the football team, and she hopes one day he'll earn a scholarship. But as much as she enjoys seeing her son have fun, Bogard admits, as a mother, sometimes the physical nature of the sport worries her. With him playing center, sometimes I'm concerned about his head being down and him getting hit, but they've taught him. She's comfortable because she knows the league her son plays in takes pride in teaching the young athletes the proper techniques and fundamentals of the game. We do what we call the heads up football training. Uh, we make sure all of our coaches are trained in heads up um, safety football. Um, heads up is just teaching the kids the, the right way to tackle, keeping your head up, not tackling with your head down and hurting your neck injury. Uh, concussions is a big issue. Rodney Johnson is the president of the league and says safety is their top priority. There you go. All of the coaches are certified and know the signs and protocol of a concussion. We don't we don't play with concussion. That's something we take serious, especially when you're talking seven and eight year old kids. You know, this is something we just don't take chances with. If a player takes a big hit, Johnson says the coaches will bring that player over to the sidelines and ask him a few generic questions just to make sure he's all right. Johnson says for him, Teaching the players the correct way to play at an early age goes a long way. When I go out and I watch him play, if he gets hurt, I don't know what I would do, but they teach them. They've been teaching them since he was six or seven years old how to tackle properly, how to hit properly. So knowing that he knows how to hit and how to protect himself, that makes me feel much more comfortable letting him play football.